was for him to me was, you know, try to spend as much time as I can with my kids because I miss so much time being, being a player and, and being so obsessed uh, of trying to be great. Well, before we bring Coach Barnes on stage, let's take a look at a video that shows the impact that Coach is having both on and off the court with his student athletes. When it comes to leaving a coaching legacy, often the measurement focuses on wins and losses. However, as the legendary John Wooden illustrated, success is not just determined by championships and records, but by the positive impact coaches make on their players as young men. For more than 30 years, Rick Barnes has been teaching the game of basketball as a Division I college head coach. And through the power of his faith in Christ, he has been building lessons of character and integrity into the men who have passed through his program. What could you say? Um, uh, the man that has all the accolades, he's won over 600 games, well respected around the country, not just for the game of basketball, but because of, of, the, of the type of man that he is. Pride, loyalty, gratitude. These guys have got it, and that's what Rick Barnes is bringing to this program. Well, he's by far the, the, co uh, the coach that spends the most time in the gym with us. He's always in the gym uh, whenever we have weights or uh, shoot around or whatever practice. He's always in the gym after practice with us, trying to help us, just to better us, and just for the future and for the team. I mean, he's just all love to help us. He's just such a, a big Christian man, you know, he's really put that faith onto us and, and um, made us realize that, you know, it's bigger than us, you know, it's bigger than just basketball, you know. Um, God plays a big part of this and, um, you know, he's just really done a good job of, you know, shaping a lot of us into, into the men we are today. As a four-time Big 12 Coach of the Year at Texas, and now an SEC Coach of the Year at Tennessee, Barnes has built a reputation as a competitor and a winner. He's coached superstars on the court, including T.J. Ford and Kevin Durant. And he's been to 23 NCAA tournaments, including six Sweet 16s, three Elite Eights, and one Final Four. But to Barnes, the real victories have come in seeing his players know they are valued as more than athletes. And it is through this mentality that Barnes embodies so many of the same traits that made Coach Wooden such an influential figure. It's also why he will continue to make a lasting impact on the lives of young athletes for years to come. What I want more than anything is to have a relationship with him that's way beyond basketball and not just talk basketball, I love talking different things with him. I love really in some ways getting on their level and kidding with them and cutting up with them and uh, laughing with them and you get to, we get to know each other in ways that people probably can't imagine. For his exceptional integrity, character and faith, Athletes in Action is proud to honor Coach Rick Barnes with the 2018 Coach Wooden Keys to Life Award. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage this year's John Wooden Keys to Life Award winner, Coach Rick Barnes. <laughs> blessed and uh, when they asked me about this award I actually said there's a lot of guys out there in this business that uh, deserve this much more than I do and I really believe that. Coach you uh, let's talk basketball a, a little bit you took a team with 15 or 16 wins last year and this year you end up with 26 SEC co-champions NCAA tournament what changed what what have you finally gotten in your program now that says we deserve to win? Well, it was a, really a three-year process. One, I've got uh, great coaches that have been with me. Rob Lanier, my associate head coach, is here today. But I've understood having great people around you, people that you know that you can trust, and, and they've always are going to have you back, the loyalty part of it. 
And uh, we knew starting that we wanted to build a, a really a culture that was built on trust, hard work, uh, and we knew that we, within that culture, we had to have an identity, how we were going to play on both offense and defense. But more importantly, we built it on the idea that, that it's not about me. It's about a team. And we're going to do that and, and accountability. And not just on the court, but off the court in every, every way you could imagine. But uh, gr just putting together a great support staff, a great uh, coaching staff, but uh, having a great administration. And uh, the fact is, recruiting players that we wanted to coach. We weren't trying to uh, go out and necessarily, we, we always try to recruit the best players, but we know how we want to run our program. And we went out to recruit players that would fit into what we were trying to get done. Let me ask you this, Coach. Our, our colleagues at ESPN talk about Fran Fraschilla, after they've been through one and come back, it slows down. Mark Gottfried, after you've been in one job and, and come back, you try to slow down and do things differently. Was that some, what was the case where you've had tremendous success here in Texas and then you jumped back into uh, Tennessee? What was the focus? Did anything slow down? Was there another perspective as you entered another high-power pro program? No, I, I don't think there was a different perspective. You know, my, I thought that I would be at the University of Texas till the end of my career, and that's what I thought. And, uh, but when things started happening there with uh, the Lost Odds, uh, Mac Brown and Augie Guerrero, the, I knew it was, and my wife told me, this ain't going to end well. And, uh, and actually, um, two weeks before it happened, I had gotten a call from the University of Tennessee. And so I knew it was going to end okay. Okay. You know? <laughs> Maybe not the way so I So you wanted. told her that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I did, but, you know, our, our kids, our, my daughter lives in, in Austin. It's always hard to leave your family like that. But, but when it was all said and done, and I remember going to church that morning, uh, knowing I was going to walk out, go to a press conference, and tell everyone how much I love the University of Texas and how God had blessed me with, I mean, TJ Ford uh -huh. and players like that, mm -hmm. but knowing I was going to walk away from that press conference and get on a plane and fly to Knoxville, Tennessee. And uh, so uh, what I found out was regardless of what plan I have, God has a different plan. Amen. And he took me to Knoxville for a reason, and uh, it's truly been one of the uh, – again, I love, you know, I, I love Texas. I always will, but uh, – He's blessed me with so many wonderful people in Knoxville. It's, uh, so sometimes, you know, we don't see it, but, but uh, that's, he, he's the guy that made that decision. Mm -hmm. Rick, what, what does it mean to win an award that's associated with the name Coach Wooden? Well, you know, growing up in Hickory, North Carolina, uh, I remember Dick Enberg would come on at 1130 at night and the UCLA games would be played mm -hmm. at that point in time. I would do whatever I could to get to see those games. and. Once you get into coaching, you're going to study the great coaches, whether it's Coach Wooden. I remember studying all the football coaches, but John Wooden was college basketball. He and Dean Smith growing up in the state of North Carolina. And then the other person, I think that anybody uh, at my era got into it, the names that jumped out were John Wooden, Dean Smith, and really probably Bobby Knight. Hmm. And uh, so as time went on and, and, and uh, you try to learn every, collect everything, read everything that you want to know what makes these guys really great coaches and you study them. And then I was fortunate uh, when I went to George Mason in 1980, uh, a guy on our team by the name of Bill Johnson became like, almost like a surrogate son to the Wooden family. And when coach was 94, 95 uh, in that range, my son was out in California, and every time I would go see him, Bill would be there, and we would go to Coach's condo, and I would sit there with him and just talk, and it was amazing some of the things that we, we, we would talk about and uh, things that really had transpired after he had been out of coaching. And one day we were getting ready to uh, go to lunch, and uh, we, we go downstairs, uh, and he's in the wheelchair, and uh, Bill said, uh, Coach, why don't you put him in the, in the car? So I pull up uh, the wheelchair right beside the door and open the door. And I don't know why, but I'm, I'm expecting him just to slide himself in there. And he looked over his shoulder and he said, Coach, my entire life I taught pivoting. I can't pivot. <laughs> I said, so what do you want me to do? He said, I want you to pick me up by my pants and throw me in the car. <laughs> I said, I said, okay, we can do that, you know. And then the other thing, we're in his house, and uh, he's got just unbelievable memorabilia there. And, and uh, uh, he had a baseball, and if I remember right correctly, it was signed by Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. And I said to him, I said, Coach, where did you get that? He said, you know, I am 97. You know? <laughs> 
And his, and his other great line was, he said, tonight we're going out to dinner and I'm going to bring my daughter, but don't you get any ideas because she's 77 years old. Okay? And so he, he really did have a sense of humor. And, uh, you know, we walked in and I, I think they're putting some pictures up. My son had the real long hair. Yeah. And the first thing I said to him, I said, uh, this first time that my son had met him, I said, Coach, I got to apologize for my son's uh, long hair. He said, oh, you don't have to do that. He said, I said, well, tell my son about the Walton era. He said, well, he walked in and said, Coach, you can't tell me I'm going to wear my hair. He said, you're right, I can't, but I can tell you if you're going to be on the steam or not. <laughs> and he said, you got 30 minutes to get it cut and be back here. And, and Bill Walton told me the same thing. He jumped on his bike, went and got his hair cut and came back. How about that? But being around Coach, I mean, it was a great thing. And he, he told me, he said, you know, my first, year, my first two years out of coaching, all the men coaches would come see me. He said that after two years, they totally stopped. Mm, and he wow. said, then there were some high school coaches that would come in. And he said, then all at once, all the women coaches would come. And he said, I realized they're the best coaches because they really want to learn because they're, they're humble enough to say, teach me, yeah. you know? But he, he told a story about a high school guy that came in and, and learned the UCLA offense. And he said, he came back at the end of the year and he said, coach, we only won four games, but I want to show you film of how well we ran this offense. And he said, well, you only won four games. He said, we ran the offense well, but we just couldn't make shots. <laughs> and coach said, I, I said, well, what would you say to him? He said, I told him he needs to work more on shooting than the offense. Yeah. <laughs> well, we hear you're a little bit of a prankster, too. So we got a little clip for you as well, coach. I was in the gym um, every day working on my shot. And one of the days I came in, you know, I just came from Canada. And he walks in and he says, have you ever been to um, an American water park. And at this, t at this point, I was already, you know, had my shirt off, I was sweating, you know, getting shots up. And then I said, no, you know, I've never been to American water park because I hadn't. And then he uh, drank some water and I was kind of, I thought he was just drinking the water before he finished the sentence. And then he pulled his on his ear and like spat the water out. And, you know, it didn't go on my face or anything. But, you know, it was, it was, oh, was kind of funny, I guess, in a way, in his own way. <laughs> <laughs> little Ricky uh, from Hickory right there on that one. That was a mild prank, you know. <laughs> but uh, I do enjoy, uh, again, really our players the most. I mean, T.J. Ford really taught me what a player-coach relationship should, should be about. He, he really did, and uh, and I do love. I, you know, I don't. I have an office. I'd never go to it. I'm, I'm in the gym with a sitting by a table. But I've got a guy like Rob Lanier who does a lot of the stuff that I don't like doing anymore. Mm -hmm. that, where he allows me to be able just to coach and be with the guys. And uh, but it goes back to the players. It really does. I mean, having time uh, with these guys this year. It's uh, and it's been a fun group to coach. Coach, there are many that wanted to be here today that couldn't. But we've been blessed to have a video, and some want to. Give you some well wishes right now. Coach Barnes impacted my life in a huge way. Um, just being a mentor and somebody I can always talk to about anything, um, especially as a teenager coming into Texas, taught me a lot about what basketball is about. Uh, he instilled a lot of life lessons within our team, and you know he turned us all into a family. I'm still, you know, really, really close with all my teammates that I play with, and that's because of the atmosphere Coach Barnes created. I learned so much from him just from just you know being around him for a year. Uh, I learned what type of man he is. His family is just incredible. Took me in as one of their own and somebody I'm, I'm always going to be uh, appreciative for uh, the rest of my life. I just got nothing but love and respect for the man. Coach, uh, I know you don't really do, the, do it for the awards, um, but I appreciate you. We appreciate you. We love you. Continue to be the same man that you are and impacting lives and young kids' lives the way you've been doing it. And, uh, we appreciate it. Coach, so proud of you, man, uh, doing everything you've done uh, your whole career, uh, shaping young men into being grown men. And, uh, you know, your continued success has been unbelievable. Uh, your leadership uh, and the things that you bring uh, will forever be remembered and appreciated from me. Uh, so congratulations. Thank you. I love you. Rick, I sense from knowing you over the years, at, at some point, God got a hold of your heart and he changed your life. Tell us that story. Well, when I listened to Kevin and, and PJ talk and TJ, and uh, uh, obviously I've been blessed with just terrific players, and, uh, but I've also, uh, I've had to go back and apologize to some players that mm -hmm. I coached because uh, I went through a time, you know, at one time I was one of the youngest head coaches in the country. At, been at George Mason one year, then got on the fast track after one year to get to the Big East. And uh, 
really wasn't ready for probably the fame and all that that would come with that. And, and, and I got caught up in it, to be quite honest. Uh, uh, you know, people look at you and they see you. I think, uh, and I grew up in a Christian home, going to church with my grandparents. And, and uh, so I knew right from wrong. I, kn I understood humility. I, I understood sin. I understood all that. But what I didn't understand was that I wasn't rooted deep enough in, in, in the Word. And so when the world came calling, uh, whether it's fame, fortune, vanity, whatever it, whatever it is, that's where I went. And, uh, and so I, and I coached some guys at Providence the way that uh, I'm ashamed of. And actually years ago, I, we went back to play Providence and a bunch of those guys came to the game and I told our uh, administrative assistant, I said, we're gonna stay here as long as I have to after the game because you know, you're ru rushing to get out. I said, I've got some apology to do to some of these guys, and I did that and, and, uh, because I, I, did, I really felt like, and I, and I know that I didn't coach them the way I should, should coach them, and went to Texas, and, and, uh, and, and, I, and I still continue down that path, but I think most people would look and say, he's a good guy, he's this, he's that. But I walk in one day in, in Austin, Texas, and it goes back to something David said earlier about uh, not, not the man that people see in the public, but who are you when you're, when you're really by yourself? And I walked in one day, and I have a son that's a missionary in the Middle East, been there for seven years, and he's on fire for the Lord. I mean, he loves telling people about Jesus Christ. He came out, he came out of his room one night, and, and I grew, had grown up in North Carolina. And uh, two people that you knew when you grew up in North Carolina was one was Billy Graham, and the other was Richard Petty. You knew yeah. those two guys. The so king. Like, in that order, though. You, you, in, in, yeah. in that order. Yeah. The king. You, you, knew that, you knew that order. I mean, you, you knew that. And, uh, and so with Billy Graham, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I was in love with every time I could hear his crusade. So I grew up knowing all about that. I, I did. But uh, he came out one night after reading his book, Just As I Am, he said, Dad, God's calling me to, to, into this field. And, uh, you know, he's, he's done it, and it's, it's amazing what he's, the inspiration he is. And then my daughter, uh, who, you know, you have such a wonderful relationship with each one of your kids, and my daughter is the apple of my eye, obviously, and it's someone I would never want to disappoint. And, but I'd uh, grown up in a Baptist church, you know, old-time gospel music. That's what I was. My wife's uh, mother played the church organ at a Lutheran church for 52 years, and so when we got married, we went to a Lutheran church, and a little more formal than I being a Baptist, but when we moved to Austin and we always went to church, my wife did an incredible job uh, making sure that it, we were going to be in church. And they started this church called the Austin Stone, and uh, it was what everybody knows today is uh, it's like going to a concert, but the worship of the Lord is incredible. Mm. And I went in and I couldn't stand the noise because it was like a concert, so I started <laughs> saying, well, you guys do that, I'm going to go ride bikes on Sunday and spend time alone with the Lord, which was a joke. And uh, so I came in one day and my daughter said to me, Dad, and my son's with her, we want to talk to you. And um, I sat down and not knowing what was getting ready to happen. And they said, uh, Dad, we don't like the way you treat mom. We don't uh, like the way you're living your life. You know, we don't care. Uh, we, we appreciate everything that you work to give us, but we don't want any of it. We don't care about any of it. And because uh, the most important thing to us right now is one day we're all gonna die. And if we died today, Nick and I and mom would be in heaven, you would be in hell. Mm. And uh, wow. when your daughter tells you that, it's pretty tough. And uh, I got upset with them, but uh, I left knowing that everything they had said to me was right. And my wife is the, the greatest ever. I mean, she, she is, and, uh, and um, but uh, by the grace of God, and what I realized, Jimmy, is, is this. I thought I was okay, you know, a good yep. guy. But what I didn't understand at the time was uh, really uh, total depravity, you know, uh, poor in spirit. I didn't realize until I really got back into the Word at, an in de at, a, at a really in-depth level about the Apostle Paul, where he talks about he's the foremost of all sinners. Well, I felt like I was. I said, man, you know, I mean, he talks about everything he did. I don't want anybody to know all the thoughts that go through my mind. I mean, uh, I would hate, I, I don't think there's anybody out here that would want a DVD made of their inner thoughts, what they think. Well, we, we want to show you something just to that point, Coach. We, we got a video for you. We're going to touch you. 
I'm about to get married in a few months and there was just is not even a moment of doubt that my best man w will be my dad just on the level of how passionately and deeply we love each other and just on the pure sweet friendship level unbelievable testimony to the grace of God that he's receiving this word today I remember um, you know, it was probably about nine, ten years ago, just sitting with him in his study, and it was just, gosh, it was a, it was a mournful conversation as the Lord was just leading him to realize, man, I've been just living decades without just the glory of God as the fuel behind everything that I'm doing, and he's just feeling the weight of, my goodness, I, I've, you know, pursued success and, and excellence and, and my profession, but just the, the main thing is just not been there and just the Lord's sweetness to, to show that to him. And then just the years after that, just this beautiful growth um, and, and just passionate love for, for Christ. And now the, the man that he is, the coach that he is, not only just this continued insistence on excellence on the courts, um, continued desire to see young men um, growing in integrity and, and growing into to men that can lead families and, and fruitful, rewarding lives, but now also just this passion for, for souls that the, the men that is getting to leave, just a, a desire to see them experience the, the love of God and see them fall in love with the beauty of Jesus. Um, wow, I just am... Uh, so proud of the man he is, so thankful that he's my dad, um, and, and just uh, love him like uh, it just feels that I wish there could be some way those words, that there's almost should be another word to, to capture how I feel about my dad. Wow. Well, um, I can tell you, uh, my, my biggest regret as a father is really truly that uh, my son and I have a daughter that got married, uh, adopted two young children from Uganda, had um, a little daughter the old fashioned way two years ago and just gave birth to a, a, another daughter that is, uh, came 10 weeks early and she's in the hospital and had surgery yesterday, but uh, we know that it's all in God's hand. But my biggest regret is that my daughter and my son won't be the ones that say that, that their dad brought them to Jesus Christ. Mm. That's the one goal that I wish I would have accomplished. Mm. And uh, that's, that would be, if, if, if a dad asked me, I said, that's got to be it. When they talk about when it's all said and done and they say, um, hey, I love my dad, at, whether you're going to bury him or whatever, say, hey, he led me to Jesus Christ. And, and my kids are my heroes along with my wife. And... Uh, uh, I, I just tell you, it's, uh, I've made a lot of mistakes, I really have, but I thank God for His grace because I know that uh, what's getting ready to happen tomorrow, because He lives, I can see tomorrow. All right, I believe that. That's some good stuff. And I, I mentioned and, and what, what really, as, as, as you get older and, and you see the timeline, I carry, a, I carry this in my pocket, so when I meet people, Jim, you can hold that. I carry this string with me a lot. So when I talk to people and I say, imagine this string is all of eternity. And it, this white, it goes on forever and ever and ever. And right here represents, this red represents 100 years. I can tell you for 18 years, my first 18, 18 years of my life, I loved it. Then I got on the fast track in the middle where I'm telling you I fell far from grace. And then I decided, uh, or God decided that, hey, do you want this hundred years or do you want all of eternity? And when I was watching that tape, Coach Wooden now is somewhere right in this part of his eternity because I know he's in heaven. Mm -hmm. I know he is. Mm -hmm. I thought about Dean Smith the same way, guys. And what I've realized, what I've realized is, and it's in the Bible that if you chase this world, if you just chase this world, you're not going to get the eternity that you want because you're either going to go to heaven or hell. Mm -hmm. And that's it. I believe in that with all my heart. And so if it means losing this world, to gain the next, that's what I want to do because I do want to be in heaven with my my kids and my wife. And the other day I was watching the Billy Graham uh, funeral 
and I thought one of the greatest things his son was preaching there, and the way he ended it was this. He said, yesterday my father went into glory, and he said, I can see Bev Shea, I can see Cliff Bears, I can see Mom, I can see them all waiting on him, but I don't think they're sitting there thinking, hey, Billy Graham, this great evangelist that's coming home, we got to have this really big party. They're not saying that. When Jesus Christ sees him, he's just going to say, welcome home, child. It doesn't matter what he's done here other than the fact that he loved him, and it's not going to be a big celebration other than the fact, like all of us, that's what we got to want to hear. Welcome home, child. Amen. Coach, thank you. Well, let's give Coach a hand, folks. Coach, thank you. And I, I'd like to say, Nick is such a handsome guy, thank God he don't look like his daddy. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Coach. Uh, Rick, thank you for, uh, how about the transparency of his heart this morning? Mm -hmm. huh? mm -hmm. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. The blessing that he is uh, to all of us this morning, uh, it's very clear to me that uh, Jesus changed your life. He changed your heart. He changed you as a man. He turned your heart towards eternity just like he's done for Adrian and mm -hmm. uh, thankful for, for my, my, uh, my own heart as well. There may be some here in this audience this morning that don't have that peace in your heart. You've never trusted Jesus with the white part of that string in your life, the eternal part, that you are chasing the wrong things in life, your, your heart's desiring the wrong things, maybe your world doesn't make sense, you lack a purpose, you have confusion and you're ready for a change in your life. And what better day to have a change in your life than after hearing a real, a real guy. Mm -hmm. like he's not a preacher, he's a real man with a real story of a heart that was changed by God, mm -hmm. the impact of that. So I wanna pray for anyone in this audience right now, I ask you all to bow your head and join me. Amen. That if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord and Savior in your heart, this, this would be the moment that you tell your family someday, God changed my heart one morning at the final four. Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. You are awesome, God. And Father, I pray right now that you speak very clearly to the hearts of those in this room that don't know you for who you truly are. Father, I ask that you speak to their heart and you give them confidence of who you are that they confess in their heart with their tongues right now that they're a sinful man or a sinful woman in need of a Savior. And Father, they want a new life in you. They want a new direction from you. They cast their cares upon you. They say thank you for staying on that cross for them. Father, you could have come down off that cross yesterday. And Father, you chose to stay because you love us. But on the third day, Father, you rose. And Lord, fill that into the heart right now of those that don't believe or are choosing to believe in you for the first time right now. Father, I thank you for the life, if there's only one, that was changed in this room this morning through the power of, through the power of Coach's testimony That's right. and how you've changed his heart. Lord, you are a great and mighty God, and we give you all the praise. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. I appreciate it. Well that. done, Coach. Thank you, Coach. Well done. I love you. Love you, too. <laughs> Thank you, Coach. Wow. Eric Nelson. We're going to Big East get ready to come up here. All right. In just a moment. No, not in just a moment. Coach. Thank you. Yeah. You're awesome. Thank Amen. you again. Thank you. In just a moment, Eric Nelson is going to come to, back to the stage to follow up on Coach's remarks and let our audience know how they can respond. But for now, Coach, thank you for all you've done for us and continue to do for us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear for the 2018 Keys to Life Award winner, again, Coach Rick Barnes. Rick, thank you. I'd like to welcome back to the stage, Eric Nelson. Eric? There you go. Um, 
Coach Barnes, thank you. Thank you for bringing the real. We're grateful. I'm touched, and so I, I'm grateful for your transparency and uh, sharing your journey with Jesus. We've got a little mop-up here.